There is a new type of dough out there, and it is not gluten-free. It's not keto, but it is healthy. You're listening to the What's Good Dough podcast, and it's your boy, Idriff. And today we are talking with Michael Rowland of Yo. That is Y-O-U-G-H. And if you can kind of guess by now with a letter Y, it has to do with yogurt. And yes, Greek yogurt. How much Greek yogurt are we talking about here to make this dough? Well, it's the first ingredient. And it's very exciting because it's quite delicious and it's high in protein. And in this episode, we're going to talk about how they started this company, as well as what it's like to be a startup founder. The CEO, Michael, is very experienced when it comes to starting businesses, and I think you are going to enjoy this one. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. And remember to always ask, what's good, dough? This is one of the few episodes on the podcast where I actually get to try the product first. Shout out to this company, Yo, who's doing some amazing things. And I have the CEO and founder with me, Michael, on the show. Welcome. How are you doing? Thanks so much, Idriff. I really appreciate you having us on. Uh, really well. Got a, a good workout in this morning and had some yo myself yesterday. So I'm glad we got to get you some samples. I've been eating this every day. So it's I work up yo appetite as I like to cornerly joke with our team. And then I work it off and you know rinse and repeat. The good news is when you eat frozen pizza every day, it's actually healthy for you. When a, there was a period in my life where I was eating pizza every day, I was just gaining a bunch of weight. <laughs> oh, I drift. You and me both. I was in the food delivery business before this. And I'm just like now I eat what I preach. I used to order in from all my delivery clients back in the college days. I quickly realized passing out cookies on campus, ordering in junk every night. My stomach did not really agree with that. And I gained some weight pretty quickly. So luckily that happened at such a young age and it was a great learning experience for me because I know we were talking right before this, how important self-care is. So I've learned coming into this project where we're a clean and simple ingredient brand to, we have to eat what we preach and actually be healthy. So I've been way more cognizant starting yo to know what I'm actually putting into my body now. 100%. Yeah. You should definitely be an advocate for the food that you make or serve and, and you should actually like and consume it. I firmly, firmly believe that. Before we get too far along into this show, there is this one tradition that I like to keep and uphold and that is asking my guests this one question. There's no right or wrong answer. What's good dough? What's good dough to me is a world where every day I can crush a lot of dough and not feel bloated the next morning. I think like last night I made cinnamon rolls and not to be a proponent. That's one of my biggest vices is late night eating, but it's been awesome. What's good dough is being able to eat a late night frozen pizza and not feel like crap the next day. That's what comes to mind right out of the gates because I did that with our product last night and I'm feeling great. True story. I ate your frozen pizzas late at night because I always have that craving for pizza late at night. And I didn't feel bad about it because it was so light. And I looked at the nutrition, the nutritional box on the backside. It provided some protein, which I'm, I'm trying to get because I'm working out. And so maybe you could talk to me about this phenomenon of a dough because it's quite unique. Thank you. You know, so the Greek yogurt, that's the magic of it, is the reality is it allows us to have less flour in the actual pizza. So when you think about it, normal pizza with flour and water, it requires more flour. Our Greek yogurt allows the ratio to be way less flour. Naturally, the protein in the yogurt allows the whole product to be packed with not only protein, so you get your high protein, your lower calories. We also have postbiotics in the dough. So that provides a lot of benefits, antioxidants, gut health, things. When you think of probiotics, for example, probiotics die in the heat with cooking. So we don't have actual probiotics in our products at the moment, but postbiotics have a lot of similar benefits. And you're starting to slowly see that trend pick up steam in the food world. And uh, we're very happy about that because from what we've gathered early on, we're not gluten-free, we're not dairy-free. We wanted to keep this clean and simple without sacrificing flavor for health. I think you see a lot of these brands, they follow the trends, they're gluten-free, they're dairy-free. Then when you kind of you know, dig under the hood a little bit, you're like, wait a minute, there's a lot of junk in this stuff. We wanted to make sure it tastes great, keep it simple, 
what we use organic wheat flour, which is glyphosate free. The two ingredient dough trend, we actually started this off of online with the Weight Watchers, the fitness community. They call for self-rising flour, which you'll see in European colonies, they ban it a lot of times oh. because of the gluten sensitivities with unbleached and bleached flour. So that was the pivot we made to make sure to be a healthier version of this without having to even go down the gluten-free route and sacrificing taste and even potentially being a clean label product. Okay. Real quickly, just have maybe give a high level summary. What is postbiotics? Because that is the first time I've ever heard that term before. So postbiotics are the byproduct of probiotics. So think of when the, the probiotics die in the heat, the postbiotics actually that are still front and center, they serve as anti-inflammatory, antioxidants, and it, it's actually for immunocompromised people, less risky because of the bacteria that dies in the heat. Mm. So- when we first started this project, we at first were like, oh man, that's brutal. The postbiotics, I mean, the probiotics die in the heat. We quickly realized though, why are we still feeling so amazing? It's those postbiotics. So it gives your gut that little cushion. So when you when you ate our pizza and didn't feel, you know, normally after a frozen pizza or any pizza for that matter, that there's that little bloated sluggish feeling, the postbiotics, there's no doubt with the Greek yogurt, that's the major benefit here. And when you combine with the high protein, you're satisfied. You eat one of our pizzas, you're not wanting to stuff your face an hour later with other junk. It's just like, oh, wow, I'm feeling fulfilled right now. Yes, yes, yes. The interesting thing about your pizza that I was just couldn't stop reading was like, ingredient number one, Greek yogurt. That's like, if, if a pizza maker were trying to put that in like bigger percentages, like there would be more water in your dough than flour if you were just making a traditional pizza, right? Because that is technically your liquid. Um, Absolutely. And so with the limited ingredients that you have, you mentioned you're not using self-rising flour. What do you use to leaven this dough, if, if anything at all? That's the beauty of the Greek yogurt. So all we have in this product is Greek yogurt, organic wheat flour, a healthier baking powder with monocalcium phosphate and sea salt. Got it. So when you think about it, that, that's been the beauty of this whole project is the yogurt compensates for a lot of things you usually see with regular bread. We even, a family friend of mine has been a baker for decades. And when we first were toying around with this, trying to actually figure out our formula because at first it was stovetop, which delusionally we thought, oh, two ingredient dough, you could just sell this to the masses. Great. Let's get this started. Our baker family friend quickly was poking around. He's like, guys, that's just not how this works. And he was stumped early on. He's like, I'm not understanding yo Greek yogurt. He's like, I've been a baker forever. I've never done that with bread. So the beauty of it is that we were seeing so many of these people in the Weight Watchers and fitness trainers making this online during the pandemic. It's still a huge trend. And then when you see the benchmarks in cauliflower, chickpea, some of these brands have paved the way for better for you. So we, we always say to ourselves, look at the benchmarks who have done things really well. It's very rare you have to reinvent the wheel. We're not Elon Musk here trying to build the Hyperloop. So that's, that's what we really stick to our guns on. Keep it simple and focus on Greek yogurt being the star, knowing, okay, pizza is a great gateway. We're also selling dough as like a healthier Pillsbury Doughboy, which like I was telling you earlier, I made cinnamon rolls last night. I'm going to make a breakfast sandwich right when we get off here. So it has that springboard effect of different things we can roll out. The pizza maker who is running a restaurant right now may be listening to this thinking, I want a better for you option. And they don't want to go the cauliflower crust because they don't like the taste. They don't like the gluten-free crust because of whatever the case may be. But they may like the high protein option because they themselves are trying to prioritize protein in their life. And that's the type of food they want to serve. Do you have maybe a way to direct them and how to find that right formulation for them? Or is there a way you can share on how you discovered your formulation in a, in a bit more detail? So yeah, and one, a couple things here. I think for us, our website, we're very transparent about our, our ingredients. I think from a convenience standpoint, we're really trying to build out. We started with direct to consumer. We're working on getting in retail now with frozen shipping. It's just the necessary evil in the business we're in. With that being said, 
we do see a lot of opportunities with restaurant distribution down the road, whether it's being on menus with actual products or with us providing our dough to restaurant tours, to your point. I think once our identity is built up and we've, we've proven retail velocity, that's something down the road we could do. In the meantime, I think, you know, I dealt with restaurants and food delivery for a long time. They, they know what works and what doesn't pretty quickly, and they're set in their ways when they know what works. I think it's a risky endeavor for a restaurant tour to play the game of mixing and matching. Like if they want to formulate their own yogurt dough, they definitely could. It's easy to make. I think it comes down to the type of pizza place it is. With the trends we have these days, you see people from a marketing end. I have a friend that runs a really successful pizza place in Connecticut, actually. And he, I can't imagine him ever doing something like this just based on the demographic they're in and their customers. With that being said, consumers are changing. Like when I was in college 20, 15, 20 years ago, it was a much different ballgame. Like what kids were actually thinking going into college, they didn't care about these things. So the consumers are way more educated now on caring about what they're eating. So I think to your point, that that is something you're going to see become front and center even more. And you do see restaurants offering cauliflower crusts and things of that nature as well right now. The interesting thing about it is the pizzeria that I worked for, they started offering those cauliflower crusts and the gluten-free crusts. They were frozen in discs. And you all make a naked crust that could easily be shipped over to a pizzeria if they wanted to, I'm assuming. And the thing that I want to highlight here is like you are trying to create the demand with the consumers first because they're going to go in turn to their pizzeria and be like, do you guys have yogurt based crust? Do you guys have yogurt based crust? And when like people start talking and whatnot, then the pizzeria is going to be like, all right, they've hit the quote unquote retail velocity. Maybe we should look into this. Is that kind of like- You just nailed it. That's why we had to launch DTC first. And it's the same what you just said about retail. So consumers going into their local grocery store and being like, hey, why don't you have yo on the shelves yet? I used to see that in restaurant delivery when we couldn't get a client to sign up. We had customers being like, why aren't you on their website? That's all I ever order from. And that's the best way to build trust with a potential vendor like that. So you just nailed why we had to actually launch online at first while waiting to get into retail because we don't know exactly the timeline coming into this project. We could be in retail as soon as next month, or it might take another few months, but at least We marked our territory first to market with this. We're community building. People are allowed to try our product, order right through our website right now. And we actually just launched on GoPuff in New York City last weekend. So that's been an exciting funnel because right now, our website, because of frozen shipping costs, we're only able to sell packs. So you can't buy an individual pizza or dough on our site. On GoPuff in New York now, you can buy them individually. So that's been part of the dynamic for us too, is making sure we could be affordable, but also, you know, we have to have money in the bank to build out retail here and not lose money on these transactions ongoing. If anyone can't tell by now, this is a startup consumer price goods CPG brand selling frozen pizza direct to consumer. We're using terms like retail velocity. We're talking about like food delivery. Michael, could you do me and the audience a favor and and talk a little bit about your background? Because this isn't your first foray into the food space. And I would love to see how you got into food and how it connects to this current project of Yo. Absolutely. So I went to Indiana University. I actually wanted to be a sports broadcaster growing up diehard sports fan. I was always told I had a unique voice, went hard in the paint, call it like throughout high school, broadcasting camps, you name it, had a radio show. Can't come college. My uncle ran a diamond blade business. So he always was someone I looked up to as a kid, had his own business. I would work for him over the summers. He did selling like masonry, tiles, concrete, people in construction that needed to cut which was nonstop in demand. I would be cold calling from his warehouse as a 15 year old during the summer. And I got the entrepreneurial itch. Even back then I wanted to be an announcer, but some part of me was like, you know what? I see my uncle having his own business with all these employees and something just called out to me. I drift at the time where I'm like, wow, this is appealing. I didn't know what it meant then. Come college, I went down freshman year, had a show broadcasting, did some play by play for some sports. Something hit me at 18. I was like, this is cool, but I don't want to be doing the the same thing the rest of my life. 
So it dawned on me then, I'm like, I need to do my own thing. It just so happened, this was like early Google days. So they only had like yellow pages. It wasn't like Google it by default. It's crazy to think that was 2005 at this point. So I got back from spring break a day early. You couldn't have a car freshman year. The cafeterias were closed. So back then they had a hotline called 855-IUIU that you would call for getting connected to anything in town. In this case, restaurants. Called this, got connected to this place called Peach Garden. It was a Chinese restaurant. I'll never forget. I never got my food that night, I drip. So I'm here as a kid growing up in New Jersey, like diehard foodie. I grew up very close to New York City, would go there almost every weekend for pizza, for soup, dumplings, you name it. So coming from that and my mom's fridge and always having that stock, luckily, to then a college kid who has to make grilled cheese and like a George Foreman grill, I was struggling and I immediately something hit me. I was like, why did this just happen? So I called back that hotline and asked them how many times did they get calls saying, oh, we want delivery. Can you connect me to so-and-so? The woman, the operator told me thousands a day. So my 18-year-old brain, I'm not a tech person. I didn't know really what that meant. It just so happened a buddy of mine, this is just so random. It just goes to putting yourself out there. A friend I had met in the dorms, he had a family friend visiting town with his parents, a kid a year younger. They were just seeing if they wanted to send him to Indiana. For some reason, they invited me out to dinner with them to this place called Scotty's. We're just schmoozing, eating, catching up. Pete was my first business partner in this project who I who invited me out that night. He they they had somebody that had just started a menu pages at Penn State, a couple of guys. And we were at the time actually thinking about launching like a sub and wrap place. They did this like salads, wraps, East Coast style. They didn't have it in Indiana University. So there were a lot of East Coast kids there. And I was like, OK, there's a major demand here. Luckily, I got some great advice. My dad flat out called me and said, Mike, if you're opening a restaurant, are you prepared to be living in Bloomington, Indiana for the next decade? I wasn't even thinking that far ahead. Who does at that age? And I was like, no, absolutely not. And he's like, you should think more about if a restaurant's in the cards. It just so happened the guys that invited us out to dinner, the family friend, their nephew had just started this menu page company at Penn State called Lion Menus. We got connected to them. It had just started a few months previously. They were looking into expanding the model. It was a few guys at a frat that had seen instant success, basically compiling menus to one place. So we worked out some sort of licensing short-term thing just to get our feet wet. At the time, honestly, I thought it was a good resume builder, way to meet girls on campus, eat some food. I was still kind of not sure what it was leading to. The thing took off. We hit the ground running with it. It turned into a viable business pretty quickly because there was a need for it. Indiana University, 35,000 students. We were the first to market, which is always a huge value in that world. The challenge was back then, IDRIF, was people didn't order food online. So at first, we were getting restaurants to buy advertising from us by just showing them, look how much traffic we're bringing you. So imagine like a yellow page is all in one place where we would just drive people and promote on campus with like postcards, getting restaurants to give us food. And then we would set it up with the website with a, a phone number to forward to the restaurant where we would create a phone number to show them, look how much traffic is clicking on this site on our website, and it would then forward to their restaurant. So that was our initial, uh, that was really our introduction to food. I, no, I by no means had any food background before that. And that turned into, from advertising, we then built out online ordering so people could start ordering right through our website. And at first, we didn't even do our own delivery. We just worked with like the dominoes of the world that did their own delivery. We would bring them incremental business and then charge them a fee for, or for only the business we brought them. And then we'd sell banner ads on our site. So imagine we get 10,000 views a day. Every time someone goes to the site, if someone wanted a banner showing up every time, that was one of one exposure, which would be the top, the top advertising package. We did really well. So come, you know, junior year of college, I was selling hundreds of thousands of dollars in advertising just in Bloomington. 
My brother, Dan, went to Boulder. I got him started with the menu site there. He did a great job too. We ended up teaming up and launching the city of Denver. And that did well. The guys that started this in Penn State ended up selling their overall company back in 2015. And my family luckily was a part of that since we were around at the beginning. And then we went off on our own. I know it's a long-winded answer. It was kind of a, a crazy roadmap. We went off on our own, built out a few more college towns. COVID hit. We tried exiting fully at that point. Luckily, I had built up a nice nest egg over the years of it going well. Uber, DoorDash, combined with pandemic, no money left to be made. We couldn't exit. We had to shut down the rest of our business. At this point, it was about a year ago when Yo, my long-term employee, Corey, who was actually a minority owner in our old business, he came up with the name Yo. He, or my COO who put this business together, Jason, who I was telling you about with the design and packaging, he actually is best friends with Corey's older brother who was ironically my first friend in the dorms freshman year in college. Jay and I, had we, we always got along. We weren't close by any means, but we were in similar circles. He has ulcerative colitis. And his dad, unfortunately, passed away of a heart attack when Jay was only 23 and his dad was in his, I think, early 50s. So, And Jay's mom's a nurse, ironically, in, I believe, the cardiology sector of the hospital. So she's been on Jay, as you can imagine, being a caring mother, like, Jay, you've got to take care of yourself. His doctor told him a couple of years ago, you're done eating pizza, man. Can't keep doing this. We grew, t- Telling guys that grew up in New Jersey, they can't eat pizza, I drip. It's like telling you you're done drinking water. <laughs> it's just, it's impossible. So Greg, Corey's brother, happened to be making this two ingredient dough with his pregnant wife at the time. Right after COVID, he was like, guys, there's something here. Jay started digging in. Our head of product, Phil, who's in their friend group, one of their best friends, happened to have an executive chef background. He put together a stovetop version to just help get us started with this. That's when they reached out to me. I had just taken Corey. Unfortunately, we had to lay him off because we were shutting down our business after he was working with me for over a decade. He was in full on desperation mode. I was ready to take a sabbatical. And he's like, Mike, we've got something here. We need help. I, I We need you involved just from my background. At first, it was like, I think they were thinking about bringing me on to consult. I quickly was like, guys, I'm an all in or nothing person. So we ended up having deep talks. We realized like this was the team. I was luckily, it made sense where Jay, the numbers guy he is, he's a CPA by trade, very organized. He made the perfect COO. I by no means have any real CEO experience. I was a bootstrap startup guy. I, I like to think I'm a good visionary and good salesperson. I was able, able to luckily help us fundraise our pre-seed round that last summer. And here we are. We launched uh, last this past July, about nine weeks ago, at the end of July, direct to consumer nationwide. And we're, fingers crossed here, going to be into retail sooner than later and raise our seed round of financing in the next four to five months. What a great story. And I'm glad you chose to include all the details because one of the things about this show is we try to learn from people's successes. And I don't know if you would classify your last business as a failure. I I think it was a success and a failure. Honestly, I looked at it like I made some great money. I made, I had a massive ego at a young age, made a ton of mistakes. I think though that's training camp, right? You've got to go through stuff like that. I don't think I would have ever had the opportunity with yo if that ended up going down a different path. So I'm grateful looking back that even happened the way it did. So two questions for you, because you seem like a young guy, like most of the people that I run into in college are going to parties. And, you know, you did mention this was a good way to talk to girls and whatnot, but that was all I was focused on girls and drinking and maybe a some extracurricular activities that may have may or may not have been illegal. But like, what was it like running a business that early on for you? And then the second part of that question is like, what's the one mistake you would tell people to avoid if ever presented in that situation? Honestly, I think the biggest, the best thing, and I've heard this from many great entrepreneurs, getting started young, IDRIP is so valuable because ignorance is really bliss. The world hasn't beaten you down. You have this, you have to be really irrationally optimistic and slightly delusional to be a founder. 
That's just the reality. When you're starting something that doesn't exist, you have to have that staunch belief. That's so much easier as a freshman in college. So I looked at that as a blessing because if I knew what I was actually getting myself into, there's no way I would have done it. So I, I think that's a huge deal. Mistake wise, honestly, looking back and I'm, I'm doing a much better job of this now to your point on, it wasn't a normal college experience. I never felt like I smelled the roses enough during that era. It was always looking ahead to a, a milestone or an expansion. This go around, I'm 37 now. And it's like, it's crazy to think I've been in the trenches for like not half my life at this point. But I'm really realizing like the actual day to day grind and the, the pain points and the there's no that is the actual destination. It's not like any of us have a puzzle that ever gets completed on this earth. So it's like, yeah, sure, we all want Yo to be a massive success, but say the best case scenario that does happen and we get a massive exit for a lot of money and impact tons of people, help them with their diets. It's not like we're going to then just be looking back and like, oh, okay, amazing. It's like, you've got to enjoy it now because this is life. So I, I think the mistake I made looking back was just looking ahead too much and life passes you by. It's like that John Lennon famous saying, right? Life is what happens when you're busy making other plans. That's me to a nutshell, I drift as a young entrepreneur. Here I am now, 37, making other plans, making other plans. I see, you know, many of my friends, families, kids. I definitely, it's the blessing and a curse in Catch-22 of being an entrepreneur and visionary. It's tough to be present. And the reality is you have to be. That, or else, like, what is the point of all this? So I, I think that's the long-winded answer, but that was definitely the biggest mistake I made, not actually embracing the moment enough. And I, I know it's way easier said than done, but I have been working on that and been cognizant of it since day one of this, even journaling every day, looking back at my thought patterns, things you don't think of when you're an 18-year-old. So I wish I would have known that stuff back then. And I know these days there's way more tools for entrepreneurs then like when I was starting my first business, entrepreneurship, it was a cool thing, but it wasn't like a commonplace. There's a guidebook to this thing. Now, you you know, you, you really have so many different roadmaps to look towards that you can get help from even at a young age. And I do anyone that's even thinking about starting something, never be afraid to ask for help because some of the most successful people in the world are the easiest to access, ironically, and they're willing to really help you a ton. Nobody realizes it. They're afraid to reach out. They're, there's always a what if anticipation. It, it can never hurt to ask. You never know what doors are going to open up. Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. And if you're wondering when the next part comes out, you got to subscribe or sign up for our email list. That way you get notified when the next episode is coming out. You can subscribe by following the show or you can sign up for the email list. There is a link in the show notes. Please remember to share this with a friend, especially if you think they're going to benefit from it. Remember to leave a rating, five stars if possible. I appreciate you. I love you. Till next time. Peace.